Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Lisa Coach. Dr. Lisa is a triple board certified physician in internal medicine, bariatrics, and anti-aging and regenerative medicine. She is the medical director and founder of Spectra Wellness Solutions. She is also the best-selling author of the breakthrough book, Get Lit. Dr. Lisa, it is awesome to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for connecting and for inviting me to be a guest. The reason why I wanted to have you on today is we're living in arguably and measurably one of the worst health crises we've had in over a hundred years. I'm hoping that you can give us some real guidance and strategies for making our bodies, minds, souls, and spirits so strong and healthy that we can actually thrive during this time instead of just survive. Absolutely. So Dr. Coach, Dr. Lisa, I, you have created a life as a healer, but you yourself have a remarkable story of being healed early on. Tell us about the early part of your life and your journey of medical discovery up to the present. So I like to describe my journey as being gifted with the present of leukemia at the age of 15, um, was actually going for a camp physical. I felt totally fine and they pulled me out of class and told me something was off and then the journey began. So I went through high school with a big fat steroid face and a wig and, and getting chemo every you know month or two. And that went on for three full years, but I went right into remission. I didn't have to go in the hospital. So I had a pretty good response to it. And even at that young age, I knew deep in my soul, there was a higher purpose. Like there was a reason that I was having to deal with this. And I always knew I was going to be okay. So that was kind of interesting wow. to have that insight, you know, at a young age. Yeah. Um, and then when I went off to college, my hair had just started to grow back. And I got to the summer before my junior year, I went to have my first ever uh, GYN exam and the doctor who had actually delivered me, so he'd been a family friend, you know, of my mom's, um, just kind of stopped in the middle. And when, you know, when you're going for your first exam like that, it's not fun anyway. And we, they're never a fun period. And we go in his office and he said, you've got a mass on your ovary. So that led to um, emergent surgery. It was literally one week before I was supposed to start my junior year at Emory. And when I woke up out of the, uh, in the recovery room, they told me it was actually hidden leukemia cells. So they had to remove my ovary and then I had to start chemo again. So that was pretty traumatic because again, as a, as a young girl at 20 and just all of my hair growing back and then not being able to start and my parents panicking and we went up to Sloan Kettering in New York City. I was very blessed that my uncle had a studio apartment. So we were able to, to stay there and my dad would have to go back and forth, start chemo again. I, I stayed in school, if you can believe it. I did a night class at Hunter College on the Upper East Side of New York City. And when I was about halfway through the, that second round of chemo, I ended up going into heart failure. So that was oh, um, wow. from the chemotherapy. And what's really cool to look back now at that time was that my uncle was a podiatrist and mm -hmm. We weren't into integrative medicine. We weren't against integrative medicine by we, I mean, mostly my parents, because here yeah. I was just a college kid. Um, and so my uncle started sending um, some natural supplements at that stage. And they were two of the things that are the most incredibly powerful for heart failure. And I didn't know what they were. It was L-carnitine and CoQ10, so supplements that a lot of your listeners may have heard of. And they were on auto ship and they just kept coming and I kept taking them and I got better. Now, was it the medication? You know, I was also getting some drugs. Was it a 20 year old Brazilian heart? Was it the supplements? I don't know. Um, so I was able to, after that time, be relatively okay physically for a little bit of, for a little while. I, I graduated on time. I got into an incredibly amazing medical school. And when I got in there, right, I, I, every time I would get exposed to like learning something new, I would be saying why, because I had this question about why me, like, why, why did I get cancer here? I was just a kid and, you know, I felt fine. And so we, I chose internal medicine because that seemed like the broadest 
approach, mm-hmm. like how I could get the most answers. And I still remember going through residency and, or even it was as early as medical school, like the, the patients coming in, we would be evaluating them with scans or labs or whatever questionnaires, the, the intake, and we put them on a protocol, whether it was medica- medication or, you know, different further specialists we were sending them to. And, and the, the program never seemed to answer their why either. Like it was like, this is just a protocol that we're doing. So I would ask the higher ups, you know, why are we doing it this way? Why did that lady get this? You know, why? And they would just be annoyed with me and say, this is just how we do it. (laughs) That was the answer I would get over and over again. So I was not, that was not going to be okay with me. I've always questioned the narrative. Obviously I've had to heal my body. I had to, you know, kind of go outside the box a little bit to heal my body. So I went on a pretty unusual path and I chose instead of something I could have made two to three times the salary outside of my uh, residency, I chose a kind of make your own career path where I joined a group of cardiologists that were breaking off from the university and starting their own practice. And they brought me in and I said, as long as I can work on prevention, because I knew by that point, I didn't want to treat disease. I wanted to help people prevent it. Um, so I kind of created my own fellowship. I, I shadowed a vascular person trying to understand what caused vascular disease. I studied obesity because that seemed like one of the main things I could prevent. I worked with a bariatric surgeon and, and for that program, the obesity surgical program, I helped develop it at the hospital. We had to bring in a nutritionist and we had to bring in a psychologist. So I had to have this team of people that were evaluating these patients. Wow. And I was, over, yeah, it was pretty cool. So I was overseeing it because they couldn't have their surgery unless they had um, done a supervised weight loss for six months with all of these practitioners. So I, I had that where I was able to learn that kind of introduced me to nutrition in more depth. Um, I started going to classes and, and teaching myself about vitamins and dietary things that we weren't really taught in medical school. And then you don't really dip your toe into functional medicine because what I what I was finding was especially with these um, surgical patients they would they would get their bariatric surgery they would lose all this weight but they would still not feel great um, wow. and I was seeing metabolic changes and hormonal problems and thyroid problems and I was also at the same time you know building and building a pretty robust primary care practice where with my patients, I was going into the why. And so I was learning a lot from them too, and went to my first functional medicine conference and that was it. I mean, you, if you dip your toe in, you're falling in. So I (laughs) decided to do a fellowship. It takes a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of hours, a lot of money. Um, It's like basically being back in medical school. And when you learn this complex stuff, like details of the adrenal gland and the thyroid and leaky gut and all of these things that everybody knows now, back then, uh, really hardly anybody did, I would try to introduce it into my practice. And it's one thing to learn it in a classroom setting. It's another to put it in action in actual patients and healing. So I would I would kind of dabble, create, bring other modalities in, and and the journey has also followed my own health because I was pretty good till my first pregnancy. So I could run a 15k. I felt I felt really pretty good. Awesome. Got pregnant easily, which nobody really knew if I could with all the chemo and one ovary. Right. Um, but yeah, which so that was kind of and it was on the first time trying. So that was that was amazing. But that is amazing. Right after, Right after, exactly, after I had my daughter, it turned on my immune system. So I ended up, you know, I, here I was with a, a busy practice and a newborn, and I was exhausted. So I got Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid problem. I got psoriasis. I couldn't open my eyes. They were in agonizing pain. Mm. was told I would need surgery in my eyes. I had sinus problems that required surgical intervention. And I had gotten my labs and, and everything, like, nice and normal, and I still felt bad. And this was one more big pivot point was I went to a traditional endocrinologist just because I was trying to be a good girl and not just take care of myself. And after the full evaluation, he had nothing to add. He, he actually told me to follow up with his nurse practitioner for a TSH, which is the most basic thyroid test you can do mm-hmm. um, in six weeks. And I, I got in my car. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not happy. So thinking right. to myself, if he's telling a doc He's only a doctor who already understands all this apparently more than he does just to do that. Then what is, what is what's happening to all these, all the patients he's seeing? I mean, they're not, right. they don't even know there's anything else out there. So about that time, a good friend of mine was going to close her practice because she was exhausted. 
she went to Arizona and they said, there's a guru in Clearwater um, and you don't need to follow up here, which so Clearwater is about, you know, half an hour from Tampa. Yeah. And my friend went to see this guy and he's, he was a naturopath. So kind of like a witch doctor. He did something called muscle testing. <laughs> and I don't know if you've heard of muscle testing, but it, it there's definitely no evidence-based science behind it. Uh, but I was desperate, right? So I, I went to see him. And he, because I had, again, I'd already studied, I was in a fellowship. I'd done all these fancy tests. I had like, was eating clean. I was still mm -hmm. feeling really bad. Um, and so he, I go in, he does all this muscle testing, spends his time examining me. And I sit across the desk from him when we're done. And he looks at me and he goes, how are you functioning? And I, and I was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I have to, I've got a, like, you know, I got a two year old or a baby and I've got this, yeah. you know, thousands of patients at this point and yeah. he said you must feel like absolute trash and i just started like literally bawling my eyes out yeah. <laughs> because i was so relieved that there was something that could find what i had going on so he was like you have you know three chronic fatigue viruses leaky gut all this starts le like listing it and he puts me on a million supplements um, which is, was a bit overwhelming, but only for a short period of time. And darn it, if I didn't start feeling significantly better within two weeks. Wow. Two weeks. Yeah. yeah. I started sending people that were open to see him. He now works full time with, but by my side. I mean, we heal people together. Um, and he's been doing muscle testing for 40 years. So an absolutely incredible human, brilliant. I would do tests like stool kits and look for parasites and things and I wouldn't tell him. Mm -hmm. And then he'd go see, the, then the patient would go see him and he'd find the same thing. So like I was sort of doing my own proof that what he was doing was accurate. And, but it was the patients that were open to something that may not be fully evidence-based science yet. As the years have progressed since then, I've had more issues that would pop in, mostly cardiac related from the initial trauma from the chemo. That's what brought me into mitochondrial function, like really looking at that. But I also always wanted to have another child and I didn't know if it was possible and I wasn't feeling great right after my daughter. So when it was finally like an okay to try again and it didn't happen right away, it was one of those just be comfortable with, you've got a healthy one, you know, right. and then I got myself well enough that I had my son at, at 41 with one ovary, five years of chemo and no fertility support. Amazing. Amazing. So that was, that was pretty incredible. Um, okay. but, but what happened when, with my pregnancy with him was that my heart kind of pooped out really early on. So we had to watch me really carefully. And I had, I actually had to deliver him under emergency cardiac general anesthesia that was wild so he's nine now and re the rebuilding of yeah. of my body and my heart and the journey that i've been on with other modalities of healing energy healing exposure to light therapies and an upper cervical chiropractic technique that had to come in and at different times when i was having symptoms and then i'd tested all my patients so it's like onion layers that we keep peeling away to get this body just more robust and more robust and more robust. And so awesome. that's where I've been one of the, I'd say original biohackers, because I've kind of had to hack my biology from this gift of all these illnesses at a very young age. Why do you think traditional medicine tends to focus on just symptoms rather than causes? The main reason is that we are not taught so you've got to look more at the education of doctors mm -hmm. we are taught a disease model and treatments instead of the actual cause so that was my why and that was the big gap that that was glaringly obvious to me from day one but I think it is because for whatever reason, we, the way medicine has been documented, has been structured, we have these incredible drugs, but to go backwards to, okay, here's a healthy body. How do we intervene here to keep it that way? Or how do we identify what were the steps and causes that led to the diseased body? That whole world, I just think nobody had really put the research into it because a lot of the funding has come from drug companies, as we know. So that hasn't helped. 
So, right. you know, when you're when the studies coming out are being supported by big pharma, they're going to be more on this side, once again, because the, there's not money to support the prevention slash cause studies. So that's part of it. But I, mm -hmm. I do get frustrated with other healers that look at cause and poo poo traditional medicine and poo poo doctors and saying no. that, you know, that as a general rule, that's all that we're after is slapping a drug on a symptom. It, it It's not so simple yeah. to go digging for the actual cause when that model has not been taught. Do you think that insurance also has something to do with that as well? Phenomenal question. Absolutely. <laughs> um, because guess what? When you dig for the cause, it takes a lot longer. When I, at this, at this point in my day, so I still personally take insurance, which the, with the level of functional medicine training, I have nobody really at my level takes insurance anymore. And this is because mm -hmm. it takes too long. It doesn't work in that setting. We don't get paid enough through insurance right. to spend the amount of time you need to really dig to the cause of disease and, un and peel the onion. The way it works in my practice, when we were chatting before we started recording, I'm a blender, right? I like to take the best of both worlds because if you look at my own personal healing journey, I, I took chemo, like I needed yeah. drugs for my heart. I took chemo, but here I am, you know, doing things like stem cells and mitochondrial optimization and whatever else. So I have consistently taken insurance try to keep my visits shorter, but then my other healers are out of pocket because they are not traditional. Mm -hmm. So we're able to keep the practice running because we have that extra income coming in from independent contractors that are healing with me and right. services like IV therapies and light therapies and things that are, that are cash-based. What kind of results are you getting in comparison to say traditional forms of medicine? I would say incredible. We now have 8,000 patients. So we have a pretty wow. huge practice. Yeah. Patients are over the 20 something years I've been in practice. It's really been fun to watch who walks in the door. So I can, I can tell you the results by all, in a funny way, almost by telling you like who the new patients are. So they're, it's always spread by word of mouth. And it'll be people who they just, they've already, every, everyone's more savvy than people give them credit for. People are more intuitive and people are more curious and, and people are more intelligent than, than what these big, whatever people would want us, insurance, the government, whoever would want us to think. And, and they resonate with truth. And I, that's something I've always tried to stand by. So when they come in and say, I've seen, you know, 10 different doctors and I look at their med list and it's got, you know, they've got, they're on 10 drugs. Sometimes I can fix them just by cutting down their medications and they think I'm brilliant. So I would say we have a pretty good success rate um, from yeah. everything from that basic all the way to, you know, a lot of the complex cases where, where, we we have a different approach just rebuilding instead of trying to find the cause i want to actually ask you about covid19 have you seen any patients with covid19 in your practice so absolutely they are predominantly on uh virtual we're not we're not allowing sick people into the building mm -hmm. that i'm in what i have done is more virtual support and it, we, we started out um, back in March and April and May, at least where I am, it was nothing. There was absolutely nothing, even into most of June, which prompted a lot of my, again, questioning the agendas and, and what, the, what was going on right. because they were furloughing my colleagues at the hospital, right? Like my, the nurse practitioners didn't have work. Like the ERs were like floors were closing. We did have a peak yeah. here in July. Right now, it seems like the cases are going up again a little bit. But the beautiful thing with my patient population has been, knock on wood, I mean, there's only been really one person have to be admitted to the hospital. We've had a fair amount of confirmed cases now, but still, even when I say fair amount, maybe like 50, That's I've them, you That's know, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's gone up again, over the past month, it's, it seems to be going up a little bit, maybe because people are flying again and, and yeah. kids are back in school and all of that, but they're not getting it to the level that you hear about because we're jumping on, first of all, I already had educated them on things to take as preventive mm -hmm. and then educated them on what to do right when symptoms occur, if they do. How are you treating them? What are you suggesting for them? So everyone should be on, everyone that's listening should be on vitamin D 
D like dog, 5,000 to 10,000 daily with food. Vitamin D has direct antiviral um, benefits. People don't realize that. In addition to the fact that it just boosts the immune system uh, generally too. Mm -hmm. um, vitamin C, which again, most people know that helps your immune system, 1,000 with meals. Yeah. And then zinc, zinc has is like having uh it, it's time on the stage really <laughs> during all of this <laughs> because we kind of like you know we think about zinc but we don't think about zinc um right. even as a functional medicine doc we don't really think about it all that all that much until this happened because zinc right. zinc is directly antiviral and some of the medications that are being used like hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. and another supplement called quercetin they act as what we call a zinc ionophore, which means they basically open the channel so that zinc can get inside. So we think zinc is doing a lot of the work where it's actually blocking viral replication at the cellular level when it can get in there. So those, I'd say D, C, and zinc are prevention everyone should be on. And then I have a group of supplements if patients slip into the inflammatory phase of this, which includes omega-3s, so fish oil, turmeric in high mm. doses. We do have an antiviral herb we use called monolaurin and glutathione. Glutathione is the master antioxidant. And oh, wow. there have been, there's been some studies showing that people with worse outcomes of COVID have low levels of that master mm. antioxidant. Aside from supplements that people can take, what else can people do for themselves? Like, are there any other types of interventions or behaviors that they can do to help prevent COVID-19 or just keep themselves strong? Yes. Great question. So oh, I just launched an immune masterclass, which you can um, get access to um, on some of my platforms, but there are actually a lot of things you can do. So there are clinical studies looking at inflammation being the number one thing that blocks and suppresses a healthy immune system. So what causes inflammation? Number one through 20 and not a, a poor diet. So a lot of people during this pandemic have, you know, really gorged on carbs and they're drinking more alcohol and they're, you know, it's, <laughs> they're living from this fear-based place and the, beha the behaviors they're doing yeah. are, are literally inviting it in because it's yeah. the, because the inflammation blocks a healthy immune system. So there are, one of my favorite things is the ketogenic diet or a modified version of it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what happens when you go, when you really bring your carbs all the way down is you make this molecule called beta hydroxybutyrate. It's a ketone. It has direct effect on the T cells, which is how we fight COVID. So a ketogenic diet, or at least cutting your carbs down, I would say number one, sleep often overlooked. And mm -hmm. people, there have been studies where if you can get um, over six hours, ideally between seven and nine, um, they've done studies on even just the common cold, dramatic decrease in your chance of, of catching viruses yeah, well. when you're sleeping. And then one of my other favorites, which is your mindset. We know the immune system gets suppressed when you're in, living in a fear-based cyclical thought pattern. And that has yeah. become tougher than ever for a lot of people. They're getting sucked into this collective fear and, and that will suppress the immune system. So working on how do we get centered, you know, exercises for being present and mindset has been huge. It's a very sort of integrative approach. I mean, it's not just, we're not just gonna pump you full of supplements and not right. just, and not medicines, but, and sleep is you know, almost commonsensical, but you know, even what you said about having a healthy mindset, that's actually pretty critical. It is. And if people are watching the news, which one of the first things I do is tell, I can, first of all, I can walk in a room now and tell who's watching the news and who's not. Like within like, I'll walk in and it's like less than a second. Um, oh, so, wow. So wow. what I'm doing is trying to get people to turn that off. Part of my drive for doing my videos starting mm -hmm. back in March, just mm -hmm. like what you said, I felt very called to bring information that was as truth-based as I could find and bring a calming voice. So my videos, when it first started in March, I sat there and I, I after I got out of the fear, like everybody else for 24 hours, I was like, whoever's going to speak, we need somebody to speak to humanity. Like who right. we're talking about, if you get sick, you're going to die. There's no ventilators. And we're talking about right. Right. if you breathe, on, if you breathe on grandma, she's going to die. 
So right. I sat there and I was like, okay, but what about the rest of us? We're all sitting here with like attached to the screen and, and we're not getting guidance. So in my typical inability to accept the narrative, because I do not, as I have shared, I said, okay, somebody needs to talk who understands infections. And it's not gonna be an infectious disease person because they only deal with like really weird stuff um, and they're usually in the hospital. <laughs> and then I'm like, it's not gonna be a virologist because those people are in a lab, right? Yeah. So it's probably gonna be an internal medicine primary care doc. So I'm like, okay, that's me. And then mm -hmm. I was like, it needs to be somebody who understands supplements or ways to work on your vessel, right? Because yeah, there's no yeah. way for the treatment. There's no treatment right now. Like, so we need to talk to humanity about how to, how to work on this. And I was like, okay, that's me. And then I was like, somebody's got to calm these people down. Okay, that's yeah. me. So that's I felt this um, intuitive pull that I was needing to just step up. And so I started five to 10 minutes every day from Monday through Friday, from March, April, May into June, yeah. I would digest whatever science I could get my hands on that I, from trusted sources of mine, mm -hmm. um, of course, that, that changed a million times as I, if you go back and look, we know now a lot of the stuff I was talking about did, hasn't panned out because the virus and the understanding has, has moved so rapidly. Yeah. And then, I, and then I would provide an actionable step for people. And then I would end with an affirmation to kind of mm -hmm. bring them back centered. So I, I, I did those videos and I would have 300, 400, 500 people, mostly my patients. The more I would question the narrative, whether it was about lockdowns or censorship, mm -hmm. um, more people were watching. So it kind yeah. of hit, I think the most it had hit was like three or 4,000. Yeah. Um, and I, I, what really got me was when I saw the doctors on Capitol Hill presenting their data on hydroxychloroquine because I've prescribed, Plaquenil is the other name for it, I've prescribed it for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and other things and malaria prophylaxis on people going on safaris for 20 years. Yeah. So I knew it was relatively benign drug and so I was super excited to, and I had tried to prescribe it once for a, a COVID patient, but I hadn't had a lot of sick people at that point. Um, and when I tried to prescribe it, I got pushed back from the pharmacist. So I was like, this is all so weird. They're telling people to call their primary if they test positive, but they're not telling us a darn thing on how to treat them. Yeah. So here I am yeah. again with 8,000 people, I'm supposed to know how to treat them. So I was going underground. I would. I find this guy in Texas and he's having success with this protocol. And, and so I was just mm. throwing that on who, uh, you know, anybody that would call me plus my own knowledge of herbs and we would do vitamin C IVs for people for mm -hmm. prevention as well. Cause I do IV therapy. But when I heard about the hydroxy and they were, they presented actually, it was like a whole day seminar on the science behind the drug and how it's over the counter in different countries. Right. right. So I was like, Oh my God, this is incredible. So I just went for my morning video and it exploded within hours of yeah. um, because they censored it and all of that. So yeah. there's been a lot of good things that have come out after that, which I can share, but but that was how kind of it all came, the build up to, to how it came to be. And how many views did you get on that one particular video? We are estimating about 2.5 million, um, which is kind of crazy. So it went viral through Facebook, through Facebook Messenger, through Instagram, and through other types of platforms. And then I was getting outreach. We actually had to turn the phone off at my office because people were calling from all over the world asking me yeah. to prescribe hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. Which I can't do. Which, yeah, which I can't do for people that are not my patients and are not in yeah. Florida. So that was interesting. So I had to kind of pivot a little bit with what I was doing. I was about to mm -hmm. launch my online keto course. And then instead I did an immunity masterclass and I've just been trying to kind of stay on top of what people need to continue to feel led and supported through this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know your thoughts about the information and misinformation that may be prevalent in the media and in, in the information space, because um, you mentioned trusted sources. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious to know, like, where are you getting your information from? What do you consider reliable information? And what, what are some of your thoughts around the information and misinformation that may be out there right now? So that's that's a really hard question because it gets me emotional and I'll tell you why. Like mm -hmm. I have been able to rely on 
PubMed to search for my journals mm -hmm. for topics, right? For yeah. 25 years. Um, I can study something from the New England Journal of Medicine. I can study something from British Jour Medical Journal, uh, The Lancet. And to see how these studies have been slanted and how I actually have to pay attention in more detail to the funding sources, which you would think I would have done that and I, I was aware. I think for me, I went into medicine because it's pure, like the science is pure. Um, and I, I felt that, that I just didn't see how corrupt it actually was. So that has been a huge eye-opening journey for me. <clears throat> when you ask me sources, um, when it started out, it was certain professors that I had had that I knew were really knowledgeable that, were, that weren't actively seeing patients, so they had time to dive into all of this literature. But again, mm -hmm. they were still getting it from the same places that I was getting it. When I... I, I really trusted my intuition and I, I have a very, I've done a lot of work on myself to, to get more connected to that. So that's the advice I can give most people. If you can tap in and if you feel connected, which is kind of how we got connected, right? If, we, if you feel yep. the truth and the passion from someone, which is what I felt when I watched those frontline doctors, which is what I felt when I watched the doctors out of Bakersfield tallying mm -hmm. up all the results of the clinics they had in California. Yeah. And saying that the numbers didn't correlate, you know, that's where I was, I, I would chase those types of things. And you'll love the fact that after this video went viral, one of the many things that came out of it, a very staunch Democrat and his close friend, um, who was pretty staunch Republican, came mm -hmm. together and said, if our political views are causing people to die and, and blurring science, we got to stop this. We've got to figure yeah. this out. So they yeah. reached out to me. They reached out to me saying, look, we think you have the ability to help us because you're, you're nonpartisan and you're, you can speak well. Can we like, can we get, can we try to like really dive into the science? So they funded my, I said, I'm okay at that. But I, now that I'm nervous about about these journals, like I don't even know which one's right or not right. And I don't have that level of critical eye for dissecting studies that my colleague who's a PhD in research does. So they funded some of his time and he has spent a fair amount of time really diving into the clinical trials on hydroxychloroquine that came out between February and, and September. And he's completely nonpartisan as well. So we are about to come out with our results, which were predominantly positive on the use of hydroxy, especially in the very early stages of, of symptoms. So when I couldn't trust you say sources, I'm now having to find my, make my own, like do my own clinical trial. Because again, I don't, I won't accept mm. that this, you know, okay. If it's, if I can't trust this now, right. let's study it ourselves. What information does the general public need to have about COVID-19? I would say the main thing they need to understand is that we still don't understand it. <laughs> It that's is still honest, a honest. I mean, we don't. I, for me, yeah. two of the drugs that work the best, which is uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, people talk about these drugs for prevention and again, prevention and early treatment. They're not even antivirals. Why is nobody talking about them? They're, they're antiparasitics. So those drugs, yeah, so they're like malaria meds. Okay, malaria is not a virus. So for me, that's just like flipping common sense. I mean, come on. So we're treating something, two drugs are working that have, they may have some antiviral properties, but they're predominantly antiparasitic. Do we really understand this bug? Right. Like, is it really a pure virus? Is it some kind of blend? Like, we don't know where it came from. So I would say my biggest advice for the public is if we don't understand a virus, how are we going to make a I don't even like to say the word, the magic V word, I call it. How mm -hmm. are we going to make that when we don't even understand the virus? And then we don't, we're rushing it without safety and efficacy studies. So I have a lot of concerns yeah. about that for sure, because we've got people that have been locked up in their house in yeah. fear, not getting sunlight, you know, not eating well. And then they're just going to wait to introduce okay. something that could cause a lot more damage. So I think the why, the knowing that they can actually, instead of looking at the invading pathogen, which we still don't fully understand, mm -hmm. there's two sides to this battle. There's the pathogen and there's the host. And the mm -hmm. host is the right. vessel that we have here. And right. we can just make it 
invincible and then we don't have to worry about what this invader is because forget about COVID-19 there's gonna be something else next you know, next year oh. <laughs> right I mean there could be so right right <laughs> well yeah or you know like this came out of nowhere so yeah. we're gonna live in fear if we get this magic viewer, then we think nothing else is going to come. I mean, yeah, we need no. to, we, we need to work on the host, and then it doesn't matter what comes. And you know, it's it's interesting that you say that because that's really missing in the general narrative. We need to work a lot. There's a lot of emphasis on the pathogen, yes, but not on the host. Correct. And and it goes back to the things you said about the things we can do to take care of ourselves: the, the supplements, the sleep, getting our head right. Totally. Right. Is there anything else that we can do to build up the host? Yeah. So I would say the other thing, if people have not worked on heard of leaky gut, a lot of people don't realize that the immune system is very heavily based in your gut tissue, about 75% of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an inflamed gut, you're going to be under functioning from an immune standpoint, along with a lot mm -hmm. of other things. Leaky gut doesn't always present just with bloating, diarrhea, constipation. It can actually yeah. present with vague symptoms like joint pain, fatigue, brain fog. Most people on this planet do have this problem. It's an issue where the lining of the intestine has holes instead of... Um, being selective and pulling out the nutrients from your food and pooping out the bad stuff, it's kind of a free pass and every like chunks of food and different toxins get into your bloodstream. And so as you might imagine, that is not optimal and your body has to work harder. Your liver's got to clear these things out. It can affect your immune system and, and you can have leaky gut hanging around since childhood antibiotics. Like it doesn't take much antibiotics, Advil's, Tylenol, alcohol, like a lot of pretty much what we all get into um, can cause that inflamed gut, especially the inflammatory um, carbohydrate and sugar and processed food sure. rich diet that a lot of people have. So I would say just being aware of the state of the gut and taking probiotics, maybe looking up what leaky gut is just for education, clearly working on nutritional intake as well. I want to focus a little bit on some of your work. You wrote a book called Get Lit. Why did you write that book? So I wrote it because I wanted to give people an easy read. So I will say it's about a 45 minute simple read. It's, it's written in Q and A form just so that you can go where you want to go and take the information and move forward. And I wrote it because not only my own health journey, mm. but my experience which, with all of my incredible patients, I just wanted to be able to help and reach more people than I can see in a day in and day out setting. So that was, that was kind of the drive behind doing it. What does it mean to get lit? So I like to describe it as you see that person who walks in the room yeah. who, you know, you want immediately, you know, they feel good, they are happy and you want to, you want to be around them like you, <laughs> I can <laughs> like tell. You well. Yeah. Right. We track, we tend, the lights tend to attract each other mm. and, and trying to understand what makes that person be able to emit that, be able to attract mm. that. So to live kind of the most vibrant life and to get there involves looking at your body, looking at your fuel that you're putting in your mouth, looking at your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I, what I present um, conceptually in the book. And, and you've also done a lot of work, as you mentioned earlier, on biohacking. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, what is biohacking and what's the benefit of it? So biohacking is kind of a trendy word, but it just means taking your body and giving it different types of interventions and therapies to get it to a higher level of performance. Mm -hmm. So it really plugs right into the get lit concept. Like we yeah. want to be that optimal person. So the biohacking are sort of like the steps and different things you can pull in to help your body get there. It, it encompasses a lot of different things, but in, in a lot of ways, it's looking at the function and number of our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So mitochondria is this big fancy word that just means the engines that we have inside our cells. So it's the part inside of our cells that make the energy. And mm -hmm. the, clearly the more of them and the healthier they are, the more you're, the more you're going to feel empowered, the more lit you're going to be, the more, yep. you know, the, that, so hacking, there are actually ways to make new mitochondria, which I didn't even realize um, until about 10 years ago. Yes. Wow. I kind, of, I kind of thought like, 
I've had all this chemo. I killed off my mitochondria. I just have to protect the ones I have left. And I was listening to a podcast and it was about the ketogenic diet. And that was the first time I ever heard that being in a state of nutritional ketosis, which means, Mm -hmm. you know, not eating carbs, using fat as fuel, that the molecule, the molecule beta hydroxybutyrate that's made in ketosis actually triggers mitochondrial biogenesis, which means making new ones. So that was the first time I heard that. And then that field has exploded, uh, the field of mitochondrial biogenesis over the past 10 years. Um, And there are a lot of different, what we call hacks now, where one of them is something called cryotherapy, where you give a stress. So a lot of these hacks involve giving the body a little bit of stress, and then the body's so resilient that it will kill off the bad mitochondria and make new ones to kind of handle the stress. But you have to have a balance where you give the stress without you know, killing everything. <laughs> it's got to be like just enough. So for example, cryotherapy, which is extreme cold therapy that a lot of people may have heard of, that triggers mitochondrial biogenesis where you you go into like freezing temperatures for about two to three minutes. Light therapy, which is one of my favorite topics and is exploding, um, especially red light, a lot of research on that. And that can be as simple as standing in front of these curated um, panels that have now come down in cost enough that, um, that you can actually get them for fairly reasonable. So we have one of the ones that I've researched, I think we have a link on the website and things as simple as, as grounding where you put your bare feet in the earth and making sure that you're getting sunlight, especially through your eyes. So uh, early morning sunlight uh, without sunglasses or contacts in um, can be very helpful as a basic hack for your mitochondria too. Can you walk us through in your mind, your perfect day in terms of the perfect optimal health routine. Just kind of talk us through what what that might look like. Okay. So probably waking maybe around seven or eight instead of the normal time that I get up (laughs) just because, because our adrenals do like to sleep in a little bit more Um, than having, having some time. I, I would say for me, I'm kind of more of a morning exerciser. So having some time to do um, a little bit of a workout, but the most important thing in the morning is the mindset piece. Mm -hmm. So even if I, if I can't get my workout in, I'm no matter what I'm doing my meditation. So taking about 30 minutes to get centered and whether for me, I like guided meditation or I will ground, get in the earth and just do some breath work and, and go through gratitude and affirmations and kind of vision for what I want to achieve. And then making sure that if I feel really good, I may do an intermittent fast where mm-hmm. I won't eat um, until 11 or 12. If I'm feeling a little bit more tired or more stressed and I have a lot going on, I'll probably have some breakfast earlier eating um, my favorite my favorite morning is a coffee blend but oh. it's a, a blend with oils that c8 oil which is basically the most extracted form from coconut that goes right into my brain and so i can um you know get what i want to say pretty quickly and easily cacao powder i put in collagen some grass-fed butter there's a chinese herb that helps my hair not turn gray so i've got this whole nice blend in my coffee and then that's usually my first meal and being able to connect so connect with my healers connect with my patients connect with my family connect with my friends um i think that's also missed um especially right now that it's been a little bit tougher you know our connections have had to look a little bit more like what we're doing right now on a screen but that connection piece literally nourishes our mitochondria Mm -hmm. our cells our bodies Mm -hmm. um, our mindset and so being able to be in an environment yeah. Not only where you can connect, but where you're feeling like you're in your purpose and you're passionate. So that's got to be a huge part of, of the day mm-hmm. in a day of a healthy, you know, vibrant, lit person. And then, you know, nice blend of, of vegetables, lean protein, good fats, having the basic supplement regimen, being able to do maybe some other hacks later in the day, whether it would be the cryo or the red light or I have a bed with color, music, and vibration, and then being able to just relax and be present again with family and friends where Mm -hmm. we're not constantly on the screen and um, 
our, you know, our workload being caught up on us. Um, and then before bed, I do really love Epsom salt. So it's one of my other favorite hacks. You can put like two to three pounds in a small tub. And there's a reason athletes like to soak an Epsom. And it, I believe it also clears your energy field. So from the day and, and just to get you back centered. So soaking for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and pipe in some diffused essential oils and then be able to get to bed at a decent time so that you can feel refreshed in the morning. I have a question for you. And I think it's a question that is on everyone's mind at some point in, yeah. in their life. What is the fountain of youth? So I think, and we're all, we're all searching for it, right? I would say I look and feel better right now than I did 15 or 20 years ago. Wow. Um, Wow. And, you know, when I look at what maybe has done that, it's not that I found the fountain of youth, but I, when I look through one of the number one things, if I had to just pick one thing would be being and living in authenticity. So mm. it's a mindset component, right? And I was a very gifted people pleaser, especially as healers, we tend to do that. And when you get kind of disconnected from your own self, you age faster and every system can't recover as easily. So, so tapping into what, what is your truth? Are you in a career you love? You know, how are your relationships doing? Are you self judging? Are you self sabotaging? And a lot of these things we, I was the first one to say, I had no idea. I mean, I wasn't even aware. I thought everything was okay until I started doing some more inner work. The physical stuff's yeah. imperative, but that piece is something I think most people don't realize how impactful it is on the aging process. You mentioned the ketogenic diet earlier. I want to pull on that thread a little bit more because it's really exploded lately in yeah. the last several years. When did you discover the ketogenic diet? So I have this knack of being about 10 years ahead of curves. <laughs> <laughs> like every time. Um, yeah. So yeah. anything crazy I talk about today, it's going to be really cool in 10 years. So yeah. about, it was, it was probably not 10 years. It was probably about seven years ago. And it was that podcast where I was, mm. I was searching for a nutrition plan for my patients that wasn't so boring. And I would bring a nutritionist and it was the same, you know, piece of broccoli and a piece of chicken. Like it was, right. I was researching like diets that would help energy. And then I was also studying my mind studying mitochondria for my own healing. And so I came across the ketogenic diet back then. And I was listening to this interview and they talked about the, how it triggers mitochondrial biogenesis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, wait, a diet. I've been looking for a diet that's different. So what is this thing? And then the guy that was being interviewed was like, he said, well, at my labs at the university of South Florida, blah, blah, blah. And I like dropped my pen because I was like, oh my God, it's 15 minutes from my office. So in my typical way, I literally picked up the phone and called them. <laughs> um, yeah. And I like, I found his email or whatever. I'm like, I'm a doctor in South Tampa. I can't believe what you're doing. It sounds so fascinating. So yeah. he's like the father, one of the, the main guys that brought brought keto to the forefront. His name's wow. Doc, um, Dr. Dom D'Agostino and he's done most of the PhD oh. work. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's done most of the PhD work because he was studying how in Navy SEALs, how to prevent them from seizing for long periods of time under the water. Mm. And the ketogenic diet has been around since the 1920s for prevention of seizures in epileptic children. So that was kind of how he started studying it. And he took me so I could see all his rats and, and different studies yeah. that he was doing with animals. And so I was like, I am on it. And I started myself and I started a group of patients and I watched them closely for 12 weeks yeah. and learned a lot. And I, I kind of have along the way modified how to approach keto because it is not one size fits all. It is not yeah. for everybody. Um, and so I just launched a course called keto ish um, yeah. because I want to be able to kind of reach people again, where they are right. um, to get them as close to this, the nutritional ketosis as I can. One of the questions that's been on my mind about the ketogenic diet, and I'm and I'm always a little bit cautious whenever I, whenever I hear about the South Beach diet and the right. Atkins diet, and, and I think, and I'm a common sense guy, you know, yeah. as, as as you are, you're a common sense person. Yeah. Does this resonate? Is the ketogenic diet the ultimate human diet? I would say you're hitting on a couple of things that are very important, which is it's mm. more of a lifestyle. It's not, mm -hmm. it, it's not a diet. I think yeah. it's trying to pull us back to where 
we used to eat maybe 50, 75 years ago where there was a lot more fat in the diet and it wasn't mm -hmm. vilified. So, yeah, yeah. you know, fat got vilified predominantly by big food companies. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of misinformation that happened based on studies that weren't pure. Like when we go and look back, what led us away from fat? So you're right in that this is a, this is more of a reset back into, hey, maybe we need all three macronutrients. Mm -hmm. We don't even really need carbs all that much, but how our ancestral line ate yeah. um, was not grazing all day with carbs. So, so mm -hmm. that, that's what I think why we're seeing such huge benefits with, with eating this way. What about for children? So you have to be careful with kids because um, in the rapid growth phase, they do need a little bit more carbohydrates and, and certain athletes as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I've sort of cautiously done it with overweight kids. I, when you look at risk benefit, which again is me, like with this COVID thing, like nobody's, at, nobody's looking at the ripple effect of these lockdowns. Like I, when you look at risk benefit of an obese kid right. um, and what it's doing to their psyche, let alone everything physically, yes. is there really a huge risk of them being on a ketogenic diet? I mean, truthfully, probably not. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's an individual case and the modified form of where I push the carb intake up to maybe 50 grams instead of 30, right. um, most kids are going to be absolutely fine. It's just when you do keto wrong, which means all the processed meats and the processed dairy and there's no vegetables, then you're going to get in trouble with a kid. If you do it correctly with tons of veggies, and I mean, you can even do keto vegan if you wanted to, which is tough. Um, but if you can get the veggies in the kid, <laughs> and you can get the veggies in the kid and, and do, it, do it cleanly, I think it's totally fine. Do you think it's viable long-term ketogenic diet? I don't think any like narrow diet is viable long term. There are too many options and tempting things and people feeling deprived. And so what I recommend is doing it pretty intensely for about four to six weeks, because otherwise your body does not learn how to transition its fuel source. So I recommend doing that pretty like strict and then going into some cyclical form, whether that is, you know, the weekends, you're going to have some more carbs or whatever works for your particular body. And some people, it doesn't work at all. They, they don't have fat digesting enzymes and they feel worse. So it really is an individual trial and error. But I think that overall long-term suppression of inflammatory carbs, 100%, whatever way that looks like for you. You mentioned intermittent fasting earlier, uh, and that is also something that has taken off in recent years. Tell us about intermittent fasting. What are some of its benefits? And is it viable as part of a lifestyle? So intermittent fasting can literally be as simple as skipping breakfast. That's how I like to explain it. I mean, literally. It sounds like this really fancy word. And right, right. it just means that there's going to be a rest period. So... Yeah. It's however many hours, right, that we go without food. Concept with intermittent fasting is just that when you're eating all day, like a lot of the misinformation we've had over the past 20 years or whatever, you don't give your body a rest and to have some time to rest and repair. It's spending more of its energy in digesting. So the concept and what happens with intermittent fasting is things like a reboot of your immune system. So imagine that would be helpful right now. Triggering of stem cells. So some of the anti-aging benefits when you get new stem cells, you're like redoing your, your body, basically getting all new stuff in. Those are the couple of most impressive things that you see with intermittent fasting. Clarity and mental thinking, you see a lot of that with keto as well. What I usually recommend with intermittent fasting is that you tap into you once again, like getting in connected to your host because if if you're having a lot of stress, intermittent fasting can actually cause more stress. If you are feeling on top of it and you're working out and you've taught your body how to live off of fat, then amazing, you know, see how condensed you can do your eating window. And, and what I run into with patients, sometimes if they're going really narrow, they're just not getting enough nutrients. So yeah, yeah. that would be a problem. I think cycling it in depending on the individual needs, it, it can be very successful. I tend to, when I'm feeling great and I'm predominantly fat adapted and I feel like I can get all my nutrients in, I'll usually have my coffee blend more like 11 or 12. And then I'll eat 
something small, maybe like a two or three and have a late dinner. And then I try to stop eating by about seven. That's kind of what I've done. Women, it's a little bit tougher to do sustained intermittent fasting than it is for men in my experience with hormonal shifting. Yeah. Um, so sometimes women that are still having periods, they will have to cycle it with their periods. I tend to, like I said, cycle it with stress. So it has incredible benefits, but it also needs to be put into the host environment in the right way. I want to actually shift the the questions a little bit, but I want to ask you personally, some general advice and lessons learned types of questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? I would say never accepting the narrative, always asking why and going a little bit deeper. And that that does require tapping into intuition and trusting it. What is the greatest lesson either in life or business that you've ever learned? We can have pretty devastating, for me, diagnoses, illnesses. It was three and a half years ago where my heart gave out again. The heart transplant doctor was in the room. I was in the hospital for eight days. And having faith and trust that once again, I was not being dealt something that I couldn't handle and and the knowledge to know it was going to allow me to heal people on an even more global scale. I had to get a device place, a pacemaker type device placed in my chest. And so that concept of if, if I can continue to heal myself over and over again with these devastating diseases to the point where the cardiologist dropped his pen when I saw him most recently, because he said he has no idea how I did this and my heart's better than it was 20 years ago, knowing that anybody that's listening can achieve what they're trying to achieve and they can get over whatever obstacle is in their way right now. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Stay curious, stay authentic, stay connected keep going, keep asking. That's the beauty of living and life, especially today. What do you want most for your life? I want to be able to continue this passion of bringing truth to the world and inspiring everybody that is connected to me to do the same and to search for their purpose and the highest capacity that they could have to influence others as well. At this point, I want to open it up for you to share any final thoughts that you might have with us. Is there anything that I haven't asked you? Um, (laughs) I think we've done a pretty good job. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be helpful for us to know? Um, I, I think again, that people need to understand playing small doesn't serve anything or anyone, including, and especially themselves. So if you thought about, you know, making a video, if you thought you wanted to write a book, if you thought you should reach out to a friend, just stop staying up here, go in here a little bit more in your heart, in your intuition, take a chance take a risk, put yourself out there. And who are you to keep your message from the world? Who are you um, to keep your love and connection and knowledge? Because all of us, like I said, we're all innately intelligent. We're all curious. We haven't always been in an environment that has supported that. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the pandemic is that people have gone in a little bit more. They've had time to think and reach out and connect. And we've made connections that we maybe hadn't in the past. So just keep along that path. Where can people find you online? So I am on my social Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Lisa Coach. And my website is spectrawellness.com. Dr. Lisa, it has been a wow experience talking with you this morning. (laughs) Thank you so much for everything that you shared. The world needs more people like you in it. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your life to spend a little bit of it with me. I'm so, so grateful to you for for everything that you uh, shared with me and with us today. And I wish you just nothing but blessings on on you, on your practice, on your family. And I, I look forward to following your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I loved it. And uh, we will stay connected for sure. Sounds, sounds good, Dr. Lisa. Thank you.